Well, welcome to this first DapperCon, and it's fantastic to have all of you join us today. Uh, my name is Mark Fussell, and I'm a Dapper maintainer and a member of the Dapper Steering and Technical Committee. My name is Jerome, and I am a Dapper maintainer and also a member of the Dapper Steering Committee. So today, Jerome and I are going to spend some time discussing why Dapper was created, some of our favorite features and capabilities, what we're seeing in the community with its growth and engagements, and then some of Dapper's futures directions. And in this keynote as well, as well as the rest of the conference, we're going to be hearing from several other companies why they're using Dapper and some of their contributions. Uh, so Dapper was publicly released in October of 2019. So this month we're celebrating its second anniversary, um, which is why we're super excited about having this DapperCon. And so Jeroen and I thought it'd be great to give our perspective on what are the problems first that Dapper is solving for developers building scalable distributed applications. In other words, we thought we'd start off and share what is the why of Dapper? So why don't you kick it off your own? Yeah, thanks, Mark. If you really think about what Dapper is offering developers, it's a set of APIs. And these set of APIs are really targeted at making developers' lives easier when writing distributed applications. And you know, I know that oftentimes we talk about Dapper in the context of microservices specifically, but it's also really important for me at least to um, share here that Dapper can really be used from any kind of application, right? So you can use it from a microservice or a monolith um, or really from any kind of app. Um, and these set of APIs are meant to make uh, your code portable between environments, so between on-prem environments and different clouds. Um, and it's also meant to make your code uh, reliable and uh, resilient to failures. And these are really the core uh, tenants of all of the Dapper APIs and the capabilities that it offers developers. Um, and so if you look at uh, modern architectures today where you have lots of services communicating um, in an environment which is not oftentimes stable in terms of network or um, reliable connections, Dapper really inject these um, cloud native capabilities like retries and connection res resiliency and mutual TLS um, for service to service calls and then also gives you components that you can talk to uh, via Dapper um, and Dapper will basically handle all of the hard stuff that developers usually face when writing their services. That also gives them a lot of code portability because you can move your code between clouds and uh, it'll also just work on your local development machine. So that's really the why of Dapper, just to have developers focus on their core logic instead of focusing on infrastructure concerns. Yeah, and in fact, you know, going on to that point, I think the way I like to think about it is that the way that Kubernetes brought a set of consistent APIs to operators. Uh, we think we're doing the same thing with Dapper, where developers, instead of can have a set of consistent APIs for that code portability, um, and that way, you know, that consistency, I think, will be elevate them to be able to build applications that run on many different environments. So what about some of the background of, of Dapper? How, how, did it, how did it first start? Yeah, um, so as for how Dapper got started, um, in 2019, my uh, then manager, Hai Shibai and I, were working for Mark Rasinovich, CEO of Azure, and we were exploring the concept of an application model that uh, gives developers uh, and operators an, an easy way to deploy and tie together a bunch of services that make up an application. Um, and at some point we realized that uh, developers need much more than a deployment model. And we want to research um, and challenges uh, that developers are facing when writing their applications. And that's when we created a proof of concept that uh, gave developers a set of HTTP and GRPC APIs to just make their uh, development easier in uh, platforms like uh, Kubernetes. It was initially called reactive, then renamed to actions. And at that point, uh, Mark Rasinovich created an incubations team and that was really its first major project. Um, then you, Mark, uh, came along from a different team that was exploring the same problem. And together we open source Dapper, um, which is an acronym for distributed application runtime in October, 2019. Yeah, that's a great story. And yes, you know, bringing together those two teams, we had both experiences with building these distributed applications, seeing the types of problems that developers are having, using it both internal and external, and we've seen many of these problems. And so we saw that there was a commonality that people wanted to have in terms of building um, these distributed apps and, and something like Dapper was, would neatly fit into them, making them productive. So why don't we hear from the first of our co uh, co companies? Let's hear now from Mark Rizolovich, who is the Microsoft Azure CTO and has been deeply involved with Dapper from its inception to share his perspective on Dapper and the investments that Microsoft is making. 
Enterprise developers are being asked to do more than ever. On top of solving their business problem, they need to do it by leveraging cloud services. They need to create scalable, resilient, secure applications. They need to use microservices and containers to do service discovery, to have monitoring and logging. They need to be able to use cloud services. And on top of it all, they're being asked to make applications that are portable between different clouds or on-premises in the cloud. It's all a bit overwhelming. The emergence of programming models like functions as a service and actors show the promise of the platform taking some of the burden away from a developer, providing resiliency built in, providing service discovery built in, but they don't go all the way. What we recognized when we came up with the Dapper vision inside of the Azure Office of the CTO was that by leveraging a sidecar pattern, we could offload a lot of the complexity to sidecar code, the Dapper, the distributed application runtime, which could address things like providing the mechanisms for functions as a service or actors, but allowing a developer to use whatever language and code they wanted to use and to provide building blocks that would solve common challenges like service discovery for service to service invocations and abstract even classes of cloud services like PubSub and storage so that code wouldn't have to use SDKs where developers wouldn't have to learn each cloud provider's service idiosyncrasies and their code would be portable out of the box. It's two years since that idea and Dapper has now graduated from an incubation into a product team here at Microsoft. It's also got a thriving open source community behind it and many customers now using it in production. We're so proud of what Dapper has become and we're so excited that this community is built up around Dapper to take it to the next level. We're just getting started and thanks for joining us. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, Jeroen, let's now talk about the what of Dapper. Uh, Dapper has a set of APIs, APIs that we call building blocks that include things like service to service invocation, publish and subscribe, bindings to interact with external systems, observability. Um, and you know, those are the, you know, the APIs that developers can use. But rather than talk about every single one of those APIs, because there's lots to cover inside them all, let's touch on some of our favorite capabilities, the things that really make developers' lives easy. So what are some of the things that you, know, you would mention or that have been developed inside Dapper that are some of your favorite things that you would put out as sort of the standout capabilities? Well, that's a difficult question because you know we, we released over 100 features, I think, since we released uh, Dapper 0 0.1 um, just you know, two years ago. Um, so that is a, a pretty difficult question. Um, instead of starting off with what makes you know, developers' lives easier, I want to talk about maybe features that make developers sleep better at night. And for me personally, that's uh, our introduction of uh, mutual TLS and automatic cert renewal. So when you're writing your application, you ne don't necessarily want to know or deal with the infrastructure for securing your applications end-to-end. -end. And with the Dapper Service Invocation Building Block, we introduced end-to-end -end authentication um, based on SPIFI, which is a CNCF standard, um, to basically carry over uh, IDs for different services, which allows them to create access lists um, and, of course, have the data that's passing between services be encrypted in transit. Um, and of course, all of the certificate management is just um, taken away from developers and it's being handled and rotated automatically by Dapper. So yes, it makes your code secure and um, ops people don't need to actually manage the certificates renewal. So I think that's something that um, I'm pretty excited about. And then of course, um, you know, I've been talking to uh, Ryan Nowak, our uh, .NET SDK maintainer for quite some time. And, for months, he's been coming to me saying, you know, your own, our GRPC experience is actually not that good because we require developers um, to let go of their existing GRPC services and adopt our model. And it's not so native to GRPC. And, you know, at, at the time I basically told him, yeah, I, I hear you, but we have other things to, um, to concern ourselves about. And over time, the community was really, really um, insisting that we provide a native GRPC experience. So the next, um, favorite feature of mine, at least, um, is our gRPC proxying experience, which really allows developers to take their code as is and just uh, hook up Dapper into it. All they need to do is just change from their hard-coded DNS address or IP 
to the DAP local host, and then you get observability, you know, distributed tracing, um, connection resiliency, and mutual authentication all the way through. And yeah. it works inside of Kubernetes and outside too. Also, um, state sharing, I think for me, is a really important feature. Uh, Dapper is also a set of best practices that are given to developers. And in a microservices environment, you don't necessarily want one service to be able to access the data of another service. So by default, Dapper will encapsulate the data for each service. Um, but our friend from Alibaba introduced a really good feature that actually gives developers a choice in deciding how to share state between services. So with that feature, you can encapsulate data for every given service, or you can create groups of um, services that share state, or you can just decide that all of your services actually get the same state. And uh, that to me is also a really useful feature. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good set of features. Actually, returning back to the security pieces that you know you referred to in the, in the MTLS, and, and I, I think that Dapper is focused greatly on sort of enterprise security. Not only does it allow you to do MTLS between the services themselves, but also I think the ACL capability where you can restrict one service talking to another, the access to particular components from a service, and the restriction on what you can publish and subscribe to. And also when you're talking about you know, donations and Alibaba doing their work, I think the secrets API uh, that was also donated from the community early on, that was one of the early contributions that allowed you to abstract out secrets so that they can be held in secret stores, where I think was a, an important piece that allows the, the separation of secrets from your code. Uh, another one actually I would mention was just uh, the console integration um, done by Man Group. And I think that piece of work that allowed console to do DNS resolution and that really enabled Dapper now to run on you know, hosted environments where there's a set of VMs that's independent of Kubernetes and you can do the DNS resolution. So now you can do it on like your premises or on hybrid environments. I think that was an important piece. You know, with some of the console integration, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's really awesome because first of all, it allowed us to decouple Dapper from the platform it was uh, running on. So, you know, we had a Kubernetes DNS um, and we had mutual, uh, sorry, not mutual, we had um, multicast DNS for running on uh, just any kind of environment, right, in VMs. And when we were running Dapper uh, self-hosted, uh, we would default to MDNS, and on Kubernetes, we would default to Kubernetes. So the first thing that uh, that contribution from uh, Man Group did was basically allow us to write pluggable DNS resolution uh, components into Dapper. And then, of course, it allows you to create this flat network um, that can span between different Kubernetes clusters or between Kubernetes clusters and on-premise environments too. Um, also, you know, between a uh, developer's local machine and a, a remote Kubernetes cluster in any cloud. So I think that really helps in connecting services and distributed environments. Well, let's now hear from the next company, Alibaba. Uh, Alibaba is part of the Dapper Steering and Technical Committee, and they've made significant contributions to Dapper, including using it in several of their projects internally. So I have with us today Ian Liu uh, from Alibaba to share his perspective of how they see Dapper and how they use it internally. So Ian. Thanks, Mark. We at Alibaba started adopting Dapper back to one year ago. The most valuable feature Dapper attracts us is just as it declares. Focus on your application's core logic and Keep your code simple and portable. We found it fit into our internal function computing platform very well. In my opinion, an ideal function computing platform should be able to provide language options as many as possible. But before Dapper came out, we can only offer one language support, which is, the, which is Java in our case. And this is because the backend services inside Alibaba usually provide Java-based SDK only. The demand for more languages is strong and has always been there, and Dapper came to rescue. Now, Dapper has become the default application runtime in our platform, and on this platform, we are now having applications running in four languages, including Java, Golang, Node and C++. And we are confident to offer new language support very quickly, even before users ask for it. Of course, in order to achieve this, 
we did lots of work to integrate the internal infrastructure softwares into Dapper and contributed back part of our work back to the community when we saw it fit. We use the Dapper in other scenarios as well, but I will not go into details today. Now we are about to explore how Dapper can be helpful in the area of edge computing, and I believe it will become another interesting journey to us. Last, thanks again, Mark, for having chance to share our view on Dapper and how we use it inside Alibaba. We are very glad that Dapper is now being donated to to CNCF. And since by doing this, we believe more and more people in China will get to know Dapper and start using it. Finally, we also hope more and more engineers can join this community, contribute to this project, and build Dapper a success together. Well, thanks, Ian. Um, now let's talk about community. Uh, and the community contributions and engagement that have been made to Dapper is a super important part of its growth. Um, first, let's talk about you know, what we have seen inside the community. As you can see on the slide on the right, that Dapper's community has grown enormously since its first inception. We have close to 15,000 GitHub stars. There's over 2,500 members on the Discord channel all actively helping each other. There's over 200,000 page views each month uh, on the Dapper documentation. And all of those have really helped grow the community. But I think the most important part is that ever since the very beginning of Dapper, through all of its preview releases and it, it recently from its stable release, the community has always contributed directly into each one of the releases. And earlier this year, we had Dapper 1.0 release come out. And that was a significant milestone because it showed to the community you know, that Dapper was ready. But we couldn't have done that without the adopters who took on early bets on Dapper, used it in production, used it in test environments, and they helped enormously get Dapper to a stable 1.0 release. So we want to say thank you greatly to all of those early adopters who took a bet on Dapper to enable everyone else to sort of build out and take Dapper into production. And so now we see many customers running in production and in test environments, um, and each of the releases up until the most recent 1.4 release you know, have included significant features from the community and we continue to keep this momentum going for the future 1.5 and 1.6 releases going out. So the community is very important. Um, Yaron, from the community perspective, you know, what would you like to kind of touch on there in terms of where the contributions have been? The contributions have been all over the place. Uh, DAP runtime, our components contrib, our CLI and developer tools, uh, our different SDKs. We've, we've seen the community even create new SDKs. Um, the JavaScript SDK is really a good example of that. Also the PHP SDKs, our beloved maintainers, uh, Xavier and Rob doing a, an awesome job for these. Uh, for me personally, if I look at Dapper components, which are really the extensible point of Dapper and what provides this um, code um, portability aspect for Dapper um, is an area that has seen the most contributions, I think. You know, when we released Dapper, we had what, seven or eight components and now we have over 80 and um, the greater majority of them have been contributed by the community. And when I say community, I mean not the Dapper maintainers. So that to me is amazing. We're seeing a lot of uh, components from you know GCP, AWS, Azure, um, and also just general open source components. Um, and that really helps Dapper be um, this portable um, runtime that can take your code anywhere. Yeah, and I think those are super important, including as all the contributions. I think they said there's over 80 components now. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, um, what we're going to do now is we're going to let's hear from our next company. Let's hear from Intel. Um, and Intel are also part of the Dapper Steering and Technical Committee, and they're a leader in cloud and server technologies. And I'd like to introduce uh, Mark Scarpness to share Intel's views on how Dapper is, have contributed to the cloud native space and some of the investments that they're making into the Dapper project. So, Mark. Well, thanks, Mark and Yaron. I lead the system software engineering team at Intel, and we've been following uh, Dapper for a while, and it really appeals to us because it helps developers build complex distributed applications more easily and run them across the cloud and the edge, building them in the language of their choice and with portability, you know, taking on this, this goal of 
any language, any framework, anywhere, which we think is a great goal to work towards. So we're very excited to join the Dapper Technical Steering Committee, and of course, to be an active member of the community. And one of the areas that we've been exploring is bringing hardware acceleration to Dapper. You know, we've been building lots of cool hardware accelerators into our platforms, and we've been looking at how can we bring the value of those accelerators to the developers and users of Dapper. For example, fast and secure communication is of course core to running a distributed microservices based application. And we've already been making some contributions in this area. And now we're working on bringing support for some of our hardware accelerators that can make this work better, faster, and more securely. For example, we have our Quick Assist technology or QAT that provides crypto acceleration and data compression offload. And we've also added crypto acceleration instructions to our latest third generation Intel scalable Xeon processor. So we're working on how can we bring the value of these accelerators and use them inside of Dapper to give the developers and users a better experience. Now, of course, this is really just a start. We're very much looking forward to working with all of you in the Dapper community going forward to continue to deliver on the promise of Dapper and work towards truly achieving the goals. So thanks and look forward to working with all of you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, your own leg. Let's look towards the future of where DAP is going and some of the things that we see on the horizon for the next year. Um, so, you know, what excites you about in terms of the features and capabilities that we're going to build next and some of the project's direction that's going in? Another good question. Um, I think there's three major features that I would call out here. One is the current proposal for the configuration API that we've actually um, just landed on for uh, design and it's going into implementation. So the configuration API um, is extremely important because it will allow developers to just uh, consume configuration from their apps, uh, no matter where their code's running and uh, hook up into all of these different configuration providers and also be notified whenever a configuration item changes. So that's just another really useful API that we're gonna surface up to developers. Uh, the second one, I think, is the distributed uh, locks API, um, currently uh, driven also by the uh, larger community. And this is going to allow for things like very easy leader elections um, types of applications. So if you have a bunch of services, um, you'll very easily uh, be able to tell which one is the elected leader and basically just grab a lock. Um, and that will be supported on Kubernetes, on-prem, and really in any type of environment. So that's gonna unlock a bunch of uh, stateful scenarios for Dapper, which I think is also really important. Um, and then something that we've heard a lot from the community is about how the uh, key value um, API model of Dapper is kind of limited in that you can't query state. And developers have been very vocal about that pretty much since the beginning of Dapper. And I'm really happy to see that we've made good progress in designing for um, two sets of APIs. One of them is a query API, where developers will be able to query state that they saved using the Dapper state APIs. And then we're also uh, targeting a more general purpose database API, which will allow Dapper to offer this um, SQL-like abstraction, if you will, um, for any type of data that's saved in any type of database. So again, I hope that these features will just make Dapper a lot more usable for stateful applications. Yeah, those are some pretty good insights. Um, and I, I think all of those new APIs, you know, will expand you know, Dapper's capabilities enormously. Let, let's let's talk a little bit about some of the future direction of the project. So one of the most frequent questions we get asked is, you know, where's Dapper going in terms of donation to foundations? Um, and how's the project kind of growing? It's sort of in the broader uh, industry and the ecosystem. And so earlier this year, actually, we donated Dapper into the CNCF back in March and we donated it to be contributed as an incubation project to CNCF. And it's slowly been working its way through the process there. And you know, we're at the stage now where it's getting close to public open comments around these things. So we're super excited that you know, Dapper is gonna go, hopefully be accepted soon into CNCF and have you know, the support around that and you see the growth within inside that. So uh, what are some of your perspectives and your thoughts on the, the CNCF work, Euron? Yeah, of course, the CNCF donation is extremely important um, for Dapper just, you know, to gain these new audiences and, and have a more uh, diverse uh, outset of maintainers um, joining the project and, of course, contributors from uh, other projects contributing to Dapper. So that's going to be uh, really useful for, for Dapper in that sense. 
But I also want to talk about our commitment to open governance. And uh, we've announced a uh, open governance steering committee um, even before we uh, donated DAPR to the CNCF. And what we mean by that is that we are really trying to make the project vendor neutral and encourage participation from multiple companies and vendors to really ensure that DAPR solves for everyone's concerns. Um, and then you know, recently we announced the uh, DAPR steering committee on which both you and I sit along with our friends from Alibaba and Intel. And to me, that's just uh, a really good sign um, for our commitment, DAPR projects commitment to vendor neutrality. Yes, and you know, and to conclude on on some of the the direction of that project, I think those steering committees is extremely important, to kind of help the you know the inclusiveness around these things. But I also thought it was very insightful um, in some of the review of the DAPR donation, talking about DAPR and the API standardization. Okay, you know, given some of your insights into you know DAPR as, as an API uh, and and some of the the way that the CNCF are looking at that. Yeah, so you know, as the project moves forward, actually. I'm looking forward to separating the APIs from the implementation and really making the DAPR APIs the center of focus going forward. So you can think about um, maybe even different implementations of those APIs. And once we separate those out, we'll be able to um, improve these um, and even provide you know, alpha implementations or other types of um, implementations that don't necessarily um, find their way into the, the, the core DAPR project today. Um, and that's going to allow for uh, multiple platforms to maybe adopt the APIs and have their own implementations, which I think is going to help developers adopt Dapper in a much more natural way in uh, other environments. Yeah. Well, it's been fantastic having a chance for both your own and I to share our perspectives and insights with you today in this keynote. Uh, we're super excited about being able to uh, speak to you today. Uh, we want to thank all the speakers from Microsoft, Alibaba and Intel for giving us their insights to see uh, where they think Dapper is going. Um, and for all of you who have been involved and contributed to the project in the, the Dapper community, thank you very much. And if you haven't yet, we deeply encourage you to get involved, give us your perspectives, um, and you can see some way of contact, contacting us you know, through the links on this slide. Please enjoy the rest of the conference. Please attend the rest of the sessions on YouTube. We've got a lot of great content, a lot of great speakers for you to spend the rest of the day learning. And we want to thank you for your time.